How to Succeed, or Stepping Stones to Fame and Fortune, by Orison Sweat Marden. Chapter 14. Courage. Quit Yourselves Like Men. 1 Samuel 4-9. Cowards have no luck. Elizabeth Coolman. He has not learned the lesson of life who does not every day surmount a fear. Emerson. To dare is better than to doubt, for doubt is always grieving. Tis faith that finds the riddles out. The prize is for believing. Henry Burton. Walk boldly and wisely in that light thou hast. There is a hand above will help thee on. Bailey's Festus. Have hope, though clouds enver and now, and gladness hides her face in scorn. Put thou the shadow from thy brow. No night but hath its morn. Our enemies are before us, exclaimed the Spartans at Thermopylae. And we are before them, was the cool reply of Leonidas. Deliver your arms, came the message from Xerxes. Come and take them, was the answer Leonidas sent back. A Persian soldier said, You will not be able to see the sun for flying javelins and arrows. Then we will fight in the shade, replied a Lacedaemonian. What wonder that a handful of such men check the march of the greatest host that ever trod the earth. The hero, says Emerson, is the man who is immovably centred. Darius the Great sent ambassadors to the Athenians to demand earth and water, which denoted submission. The Athenians threw them into a ditch, and told them there was earth and water enough. Bring back the colours, shouted a captain at the Battle of the Alma. When an ensign maintained his ground in front, although the men were retreating, No, cried the ensign, bring up the men to the colours. To dare, and again to dare, and without end to dare, was Danton's noble defiance to the enemies of France. Shakespeare says, He is not worthy of the honeycomb that shuns the hives because the bees have stings. It is a bad omen, said Eric the Red, when his horse slipped and fell on the way to his ship, moored on the coast of Greenland, in readiness for a voyage of discovery. Ill fortune would be mine should I dare venture now upon the sea. So he returned to his house, but his young son, Leif, decided to go, and with a crew of thirty-five men, sailed southward in search of the unknown shore upon which Captain Biarni had been driven by a storm while sailing in another Viking ship two or three years before. The first land that they saw was probably Labrador, a barren, rugged plain. Leif called this country Heluland, or the land of flat stones. Sailing onward many days, he came to a low, level coast, thickly covered with woods, on account of which he called the country Markland, probably the modern Nova Scotia. Sailing onward, they came to an island which they named Vinland, on account of the abundance of delicious wild grapes in the woods. This was in the year 1000. Here is where the city of Newport, R.I., stands. They spent many months and then returned to Greenland with their vessel loaded with grapes and strange kinds of wood. The voyage was successful, and no doubt Eric was sorry he had been frightened by the bad omen. Not every vessel that sails from Tashish will bring back the gold of Ophir, but shall it therefore rot in the harbour? No, give it sails to the wind. Men who have dared have moved the world, often before reaching the prime of life. It is astonishing what daring to begin and perseverance have enabled even youths to achieve. Alexander, who ascended the throne at twenty, had conquered the whole known world before dying at thirty-three. Julius Caesar captured eight hundred cities, conquered three hundred nations, and defeated three million men, became a great orator and one of the greatest statesmen known, and still was a young man. Washington was appointed adjutant general at nineteen. He was sent at twenty-one as an ambassador to treat with the French, and won his first battle as a colonel at twenty-two. Lafayette was made a general of the whole French army at twenty. Charlemagne was a master of France and Germany at thirty. Condé was only twenty-two when he conquered at Rocroy. Galileo was but eighteen when he saw the principle of the pendulum in the swinging lamp in the cathedral at Pisa. Peel was in Parliament at twenty-one. Gladstone was in Parliament before he was twenty-two, and at twenty-four he was a Lord of the Treasury. Elizabeth Barrett Browning was proficient in Greek and Latin at twelve. De Quincey at eleven. 
Robert Browning wrote at eleven poetry of no mean order. Cowley, who sleeps in Westminster Abbey, published a volume of poems at fifteen. N. P. Willis won lasting fame as a poet before leaving college. Macaulay was a celebrated author before he was twenty-three. Luther was but twenty-nine when he nailed his famous thesis to the door of the bishop and defied the Pope. Nelson was a lieutenant in the British Navy before he was twenty. He was but forty-seven when he received his death wound at Trafalgar. Charles the Twelfth was only nineteen when he gained the Battle of Narva. At thirty-six, Cortes was the conqueror of Mexico. At thirty-two, Clive had established the British power in India. Hannibal, the greatest of military commanders, was only thirty when, at Cannae, he dealt an almost annihilating blow to the Republic of Rome. And Napoleon was only twenty-seven when, on the plains of Italy, he outgeneraled and defeated, one after another, the veteran marshals of Austria. Equal courage and resolution are often shown by men who have passed the allotted time of life. Victor Hugo and Wellington were both in their prime after they had reached the age of three score years and ten. George Bancroft wrote some of his best historical work when he was eighty-five. Gladstone ruled England with a strong hand at eighty-four, and was a marvel of literary and scholarly ability. "'Your Grace has not the organ of animal courage largely developed,' said a phrenologist who was examining Wellington's head. "'You are right,' replied the Iron Duke, "'and but for my sense of duty I should have retreated in my first fight. That first fight on an Indian field was one of the most terrible on record.' Grant never knew when he was beaten. When told that he was surrounded by the enemy at Belmont, he quietly replied, Well then, we must cut our way out. When General Jackson was a judge and was holding a court in a small settlement, a border ruffian, a murderer and a desperado, came into the courtroom with brutal violence and interrupted the court. The judge ordered him to be arrested. The officer did not dare approach him. Call a posse, said the judge, and arrest him but they also shrank with fear from the ruffian. "'Call me, then,' said Jackson. "'This court is adjourned for five minutes.' He left the bench, walked straight up to the man, and with his eagle eye actually cowed the ruffian, who dropped his weapons, afterwards saying, "'There was something in his eye I could not resist.' Lincoln never shrank from espousing an unpopular cause when he believed it to be right. At the time when it almost cost a young lawyer his bread and butter to defend the fugitive slave, and when other lawyers had refused, Lincoln would always plead the cause of the unfortunate whenever an opportunity presented. Go to Lincoln, people would say, when these bounded fugitives were seeking protection. He's not afraid of any cause if it's right. Abraham Lincoln's boyhood was one long struggle with poverty, with little education and no influential friends. When at last he had begun the practice of law, it required no little daring to cast his fortune with a weaker side in politics, and thus in peril what small reputation he had gained. Only the most sublime moral courage could have sustained him as president to hold his ground against hostile criticism and a long train of disaster. To issue the Emancipation Proclamation, support Grant and Stanton against the clamour of the politicians and the press, and through it all to do the right as God gave him to see the right. Doubt indulged becomes doubt realised. To determine to do anything is half the battle. To think a thing is impossible is to make it so. Courage is victory. Timidity is defeat. Don't waste time dreaming of obstacles you may never encounter, or in crossing bridges you have not reached. Don't fall with a nettle. Grasp with firmness if you would rob it of its sting. To half will and to hang forever in the balance is to lose your grip on life. Execute your resolutions immediately. Thoughts are but dreams till their effects be tried. Does competition trouble you? Work away. What is your competitor but a man? Conquer your place in the world, for all things serve a brave soul. Combat difficulty manfully. Sustain misfortune bravely. Endure poverty nobly. Encounter disappointment courageously. The influence of the brave man is a magnetism which creates an epidemic of noble zeal in all about him. Every day sends to the grave obscure men, who have only remained in obscurity because their timidity has prevented them from making a first effort, and who, if they could have been induced to begin, would in all probability have gone to great lengths in the career of usefulness and fame. 
No great deed is done, says George Eliot, by falterers who ask for certainty. A mouse that dwelt near the abode of a great magician was kept in such constant distress by its fear of a cat, that the magician, taking pity on it, turned it into a cat itself. Immediately it began to suffer from its fear of a dog, so the magician turned it into a dog. Then it began to suffer from fear of a tiger, and the magician turned it into a tiger. Then it began to suffer from its fear of huntsmen, and the magician, in disgust, said, Be a mouse again, as you have only the heart of a mouse. It is impossible to help you by giving you the body of a nobler animal. And the poor creature again became a mouse. Young Commodore Oliver H. Perry, not twenty-eight years old, was entrusted with the plan to gain control of Lake Erie. With great energy Perry directed the construction of nine ships, carrying fifty-four guns, and conquered Commodore Barclay, a veteran of European navies, with six vessels, carrying sixty-three guns. Perry had no experience in naval battles before this. To believe a business impossible is the way to make it so. Feasible projects often miscarry through despondency, and are strangled at birth by a cowardly imagination. A ship on a lee shore stands out to sea to escape shipwreck. Shrink and you will be despised. One of Napoleon's drummer boys won the Battle of Arcola. Napoleon's little army of 14,000 men had fought 50,000 Austrians for 72 hours. The Austrians' position enabled them to sweep the bridge of Arcola, which the French had gained and which they must hold to win the battle. The drummer boy, on the shoulders of his sergeant, who swam across the river with him, beat the drum all the way across the river and when on the opposite end of the bridge he beat his drum so vigorously that the Austrians, remembering the terrible French onslaught of the day before, fled in terror, thinking the French army was advancing upon them. Napoleon dated his great confidence in himself from this drum. The boy's heroic act was represented in stone on the front of the Pantheon of Paris. Two days before the Battle of Jena, Napoleon said, My lads, you must not fear death. When soldiers brave death, they drive him into the enemy's ranks. Arago says in his autobiography that when he was puzzled and discouraged with difficulties he met with in his early studies in mathematics, some words he found on the waste leaf of his textbook caught his attention and interested him. He found it to be a short letter from the Alambert to a young person, disheartened like himself, and read, Go on, sir, go on. The difficulties you meet with will resolve themselves as you advance. Proceed, and light will dawn and shine with increasing clearness on your path. That maxim, he said, was my greatest master in mathematics. Overtaken near a rocky coast by a sudden storm of great violence, the captain of a French brig gave orders to put out to sea, but in spite of all the efforts of the crew they could not steer clear of the rocks, and after struggling for a whole day they felt a violent shock accompanied by a horrible crash. The boats were lowered, but only to be swept away by the waves. As a last resort, the captain proposed that some sailors should swim ashore with a rope, but not a man would volunteer. Captain, said the twelve-year-old little cabin boy Jacques, timidly, you don't wish to expose the lives of good sailors like these. It does not matter what becomes of a little cabin boy. Give me a ball of strong string which will unroll as I go on. Fasten one end around my body, and I promise you that within an hour the rope shall be well fastened to the shore, or I will perish in the attempt. Before anyone could stop him, he leapt overboard. His head was soon seen like a black point rising above the waves, and then it disappeared in the distance and mist, and but for the occasional pull upon the ball of cord, all would have thought him dead. At length it fell as if slackened, and the sailors looked at one another in silence when a quick, violent pull, followed by a second and a third, told that Jacques had reached the shore. A strong rope was fastened to the cord and pulled to the shore, and by its aid many of the sailors were rescued. In 1833 Miss Prudence Crandall, a Quaker schoolmistress of Canterbury, Con, opened her school to Negro children as well as to whites. The whole place was thrown into an uproar. Town meetings were called to denounce her. The most vindictive and inhuman measures were taken to isolate the school from the support of the townspeople. Stores and churches were closed against teacher and pupils. Public conveyances were denied them, 
Physicians would not attend them. Miss Crandall's own friends dared not visit her. The house was assailed with rotten eggs and stones and finally set on fire. Yet the cause was righteous, and the opposition proved vain and fruitless. Public opinion is often radically wrong. Staunch old Admiral Farragut, he of the true heart and the iron will, said to another officer of the navy, Dupont, do you know why you didn't get into Charleston with your ironclads? Oh, was it because the channel was so crooked? No, Dupont, it was not that. Well, the rebel fire was perfectly horrible. Yes, but it wasn't that. Well, what was it then? It was because you didn't believe you could go in. I have tried Lord Howe on most important occasions. He never asked me how he was to execute any service entrusted to his charge, but always went straight forward and did it. So answered Sir Edward Hawke, when his appointment of Howe for some peculiarly responsible duty was criticised on the ground that Howe was the junior admiral in the fleet. There is a tradition among the Indians that Manitou was travelling in the invisible world, and came upon a hedge of thorns, then saw wild beasts glare upon him from the thicket, and after a while stood before an impassable river. As he determined to proceed, the thorns turned out phantoms, the wild beasts powerless ghosts, and the river only a shadow. When we march on, obstacles disappear. Many distinguished foreign and American statesmen were present at a fashionable dinner party where wine was freely poured. But Schuyler Colfax, then Vice President of the United States, declined to drink from a proffered cup. Colfax does not drink, sneered a senator who had already taken too much. You are right, said the Vice President. I dare not. A Western party recently invited the surviving Union and Confederate officers to give account of the bravest act observed by each during the Civil War. Colonel Thomas W. Higginson said that at a dinner at Beaufort, S.C., where wine flowed freely and ribald jests were bandied, Dr. Minor, a slight boyish fellow who did not drink, was told that he could not go until he had drunk a toast, told a story, or sung a song. He replied, I cannot sing, but I will give a toast, although I must drink it in water. It is our mother's. The men were so affected and ashamed that some took him by the hand and thanked him for displaying courage greater than that required to walk up to the mouth of a cannon. When Grant was in Houston several years ago, he was given a rousing reception. Naturally hospitable and naturally inclined to like a man of Grant's make-up, the Houstonites determined to go beyond any other southern city in the way of a banquet and other manifestations of their good will and hospitality. They made great preparations for their dinner, the committee taking great pains to have the finest wines that could be procured for the table at night. When the time came to serve the wine, the head waiter first went to Grant. Without a word, the general quietly turned down all the glasses at his plate. This movement was a great surprise to the Texans, but they were equal to the occasion. Without a single word being spoken, every man along the line of the long tables turned his glasses down, and there was not a drop of wine taken that night. Don't be like Uriah Heep, begging everybody's pardon for taking the liberty of being in the world. There is nothing attractive in timidity, nothing lovable in fear. Both are deformities and are repulsive. Manly courage is dignified and graceful. The worst manners in the world are those of persons conscious of being beneath their position and trying to conceal it or make up for it by style. It takes courage for a young man to stand firmly erect while others are bowing and fawning for praise and power. It takes courage to wear threadbare clothes while your comrades dress in broadcloth. It takes courage to remain in honest poverty when others grow rich by fraud. It takes courage to say no squarely when those around you say yes. It takes courage to do your duty in silence and obscurity while others prosper and grow famous, although neglecting sacred obligations. It takes courage to unmask your true self, to show your blemishes to a condemning world, and to pass for what you really are. End of chapter 14